Hey friends, thanks for joining us. So great to be with you today. My name is Josh Canning of You Evangelize. I'm joined with, with my friend uh, Marcel Lejeune of CatholicMissionaryDisciples.com. This is a conversation, uh, of, of course, neither of us really wants to have. We don't want to talk about uh, the topic of scandal. We'd rather be talking mm. about uh, the great things that are happening in the mission of the church. Uh, but we are where we are, uh, and uh, this is the situation is what it is. And over the last yeah. few weeks, it's been a bit of a rough time. We've got the uh, McCarrick scandals, which probably many of our viewers know. You can Google it uh, if, if, if not. Um, we've got the, uh, the Pennsylvania report, uh, you know, chronicling scores and scores of uh, horrific abuses. Just terrible, terrible stuff. Uh, and thousands of victims uh, likely. I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday a Catholic News Agency posted that since that report came out, uh, there's about 50 new victims who've called mm -hmm. in through the hotline. So essentially uh, the, the wool is being pulled off and we're seeing just some terrible things that have gone gone on over the course of decades in the church. Um, and uh, what what is uh, a little bit different now than maybe in 2002 when the Archdiocese of uh, Boston scandal was released, um, revealed. Uh, Philip Lawler of Catholic Culture made the comment today that in 2002 people were really upset with the clergy who, who did what was done. Today they're really upset at uh, the leaders, the bishops, that have allowed things to continue to happen um, over long periods of time and, and even when, when new um, you know, revelations have come forward, still it seems there's either blind spots or blind eyes being turned. Um, when you look at the situation, Marcel, of What's going on in the church right now? What do you see? Yeah, I would agree with you, Josh. I think, and with Philip Lawler, I, I think, unfortunately, what we have right now is a um, an uprising of people who are upset about the reaction that the bishops have had. Mm. Um, you and I and so many other lay people um, right now, we have this visceral reaction where we get upset, we get angry, we want justice, we want something done. We don't want just platitudes and news releases and PR campaigns and reputations that are saved. We don't care. Uh, but the bishops, and we can't say bishops and think all of them, right? I mean, there are good bishops out there who are trying to do the right thing in the right way. But too many of them who are bishops in the United States and in North America in general um, right now are releasing these statements that are just kind of meh. I mean, they they just don't get it. Right. They don't understand what's going on and how they ought to react in the eyes of the of the laity. And the laity want want people to do things that are right and just and good for the church, not just for the leaders. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think there are some men out there who are trying to save their reputations, which is the awful way to act. I mean, if you think about it, um, this is this is a man who's supposed to be a spiritual father to and he's supposed to be mystically wed to the church as, uh, you know, somebody who is a sign of Jesus Christ himself. Right. That's his spouse. Yeah. And not only has he cheated on his spouse, but he's done so by abusing his children. Mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of scandal and sin that has happened. And when that happens, you know, if if grandpa or somebody else were to come in and say, you know what, it's no big deal. Um, you know, these are bad things and we all feel bad about this um, and release a statement about that. No. Or or that he had knowledge of that going on and allowed it to continue to happen by shifting him around in his duties or something else. Uh, no, that's not right. That person needs to be pulled down from his office if he had knowledge of that. He needs to resign for the good of his soul and for the people that he is uh, supposed to be a, a pastor of. That's the issue at hand here. Mm -hmm. That's the problems that we have, and that's the way it ought to be dealt with. And we can't just talk about this as if, you know, oh, it's okay. Uh, you know, no, th this is a, a, an interesting moment in the life of the church where the laity are, are leading the charge here. The mm -hmm. laity really are the ones who are out front about how the response ought to be, because unfortunately our pastors aren't doing it too much, uh, enough, let's put it that way. Right. Now, the thing that you and I can do is instead of just complaining about this on the interwebs and videos and on Twitter and, and in Facebook and, and in blog posts and stuff like that, which, by the way, I don't have actually a problem with that, as long as the other part of the response is that you and I are also praying, mm -hmm. fasting and trying to be holy, and trying to purge that sin that's in our own hearts out of our lives, because ultimately the only real response to this that's going to get any kind of traction is holiness. And that's not just a platitude either. That's really what needs to happen is the grassroots um, generation of saints. That's what's going to change things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just uh, to go a little bit sort of deeper into this, and, and, and I like that you kind of pulled us to, um, you know, already forward to where, where, what can we personally do? 
Uh, Cause that's what a lot of people I think are asking. They're, 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 you know, maybe in some ways losing faith in uh, the capacity of, um, you know, those, those in the highest sort of ranks of the hierarchy to, to, to deal with appropriately, but maybe that's a good thing. Maybe this is, is actually, you know, we hear a lot about the, the need for deeper collaboration between uh, the laity and the clergy, and maybe this is what it's necessity that's going to actually uh, bring us there. But I just want to go back to um, the first reading from Mass yesterday, because I've noticed a number mm. of clergy <laughs> tweeting about this, about just the fittingness of this. And the first reading is from Ezekiel chapter 34, and uh, the heading is an oracle against bad and selfish, sh- selfish shepherds. I'm not going to read all of it, but it says... You know, and this is this is the oracle. You have failed to make weak sheep strong, speaking to the shepherds, or to care for the sick ones, mm-hmm. or to bandage the wounded ones. You have failed to bring back strays or look for the lost. On the contrary, you have ruled them cruelly and violently. For lack of a shepherd, they have scattered to become the prey of any wild animal. They have scattered far. My flock is straying this way and that on mountains and on high hills. My flock has been scattered over all over the country. No one bothers about them and no one looks for them. You know, I could go, I could read further, but in the end it says, for the Lord says this, I'm going to look after my flock myself and keep mm-hmm. all of it in my view. You know, Marcel, it makes me just think, you know, I mean, there's a lot that can be said about this. There's a lot that can be preached upon this, and it's really a prime opportunity for our pastors to speak about what is going on in the church. But I think, I, I recall a, um, a homily in uh, 2002, which said it's almost like, um, it seems like, we were talking about this new millennium and this new springtime and this new evangelization, and it's all had to be put on hold while we deal with this reality of scandal, you know, while we scramble to try to, you know, I don't know, plug the holes in the boat or whatever. And yet here we are again, it seems in the same place. And to those of us who who deeply desire uh, to see evangelization happen and recognize that, hey, like the world's not getting any better. People need the gospel more than ever. Um, but we have to keep dealing with these uh, these uh, scandals. You know, what would you say about uh, someone who is who's in a sense like just righteously indignant and adamant that, gosh, like, can we ever just get past our own um, skeletons in our closets and just get get on with the mission? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is this. <clears throat> no, the answer is no. We're never going to get beyond the skeletons in our own closet. Mm. Um, that's why we all need grace and forgiveness and justification that comes from our Lord. It's grace. It's a gift. We can't earn it. Mm-hmm. And the reason why we can't earn it is because we're sinful, fallen creatures who will always be sinful, fallen creatures. We will be restored in pureness and, and that purity and perfection of our nature when we get to heaven, but not in this life. Mm. So no, in this life, we're never going to get away from our skeletons. It's always going to be there. It's always going to haunt us in a sense. But here's the thing. Jesus uses that stuff. Mm. He uses our own sin to show us humility. He uses our own imperfection for, so that we can be a witness to somebody else that there's something better, right? Look, I, I have a wounded, fallen, sinful nature. I've sinned sexually. I've got all kinds of problems. I've had a past. I have a, I have a present right now, right? I mean, there are sins that I've committed in the last week. Yes, I, but the fact of the matter is that doesn't mean that you and I can't turn that back over to Jesus Christ every day, every moment, right? And allow him into our lives so that we can be his instruments. Mm -hmm. God is more powerful than we are. You see, God uses that stuff. He doesn't waste anything. Mm -hmm. He uses it all, even our sin. And he can bring goodness out of it. That's because he's God and we're not. Mm -hmm. So we have to be humble enough to say yes to Jesus Christ right now in our sin, in our imperfection, in our limitedness, in, in what and allow God to say, okay, now I'm going to allow God to come and do the work for me. He's going to do the heavy lifting. He's the one who saves. I can't save. I'm not the savior of the world. Jesus is. But here's the here's the thing. Even in the midst of all the problems in the church, the church is the perfect bride of, of God, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. He's he, God has made the church both human and divine, and we can't keep our eyes on the human and, and follow after Jesus Christ. God is God. We are not. And the church is not God either. We have to remember that. Right. But the, the church is perfected in her relationship with Jesus Christ in that sense. So let's keep our eyes, our faith on God, not on men, not, not on any human being. And let's follow after him and ask the Lord, how do you want us to act? Because it's, it's pretty clear in this generation 
the greatest leaders of the church are not going to come from the clergy. Hmm. I mean, that's that's the way I've and if you it, and I, I know that's a bold statement and people, if you want to refute me or argue with me, I'm, I'm more than open to hearing it. But right now, from the fruit that I have been seeing in the church, at least in North America, in the West, the most fruitful movements, the most fruitful people are the laity. And you look to it and you see the leaders who are going out on a limb and doing something big for God and really want to be holy. It's the laity. That's what at least my observations are. And it's not to say I'm the guy. I'm not I'm not even talking about me. I'm talking about others who I admire and I want to follow after and learn from and go. Look, if that's the fact, then let's not wait. Mm-hmm. Let's not wait for, you know, yes, we have some righteous indignation. But if you and I and others want to evangelize, that means we can't wait. There are people in your life and my life who need the gospel right now, who need Jesus Christ. So let's go and let's let's bring this good news to the world that needs it so desperately. Mm, amen. Wow. You know, it's it's interesting, and I think that uh, I, I think you're spot on uh, with what you're saying. Um, I wonder, you know, Pope Francis uh, came out with a letter uh, earlier this week uh, responding to to the crisis, and uh, in a, in a way, and I, from a different angle, I think he's kind of saying what you're saying, and when he condemns clericalism, and this is a thing that he's spoken about a lot, um, and I think mm-hmm. that it's the thing that I've come to learn in recent years, um, how pervasive it is, how much it can affect us, uh, not just the clergy. I think I used to think of it as a clergy uh, issue uh, or temptation, but it actually can really affect the laity in, in deep and undiagnosed ways. Uh, and the, 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 the sense that we need to sort of wait uh, till the whole house is cleaned up at the top before we do what uh, God's calling us to do. There's, that's a bit of a clericalist mentality where we always think we need to defer to Father. I just want to read quickly a little bit from what Pope Francis said. He said that clericalism not only nullifies the character of Christians, but also tends to diminish and undervalue the baptismal grace that the Holy Spirit has placed in the heart of our people. Clericalism, whether fostered by priests themselves or by laypersons, leads to an excision in the ecclesial body that supports and helps perpetuate many of the evils that we are condemning today. To say no to abuse is to say an emphatic no to all forms of clericalism. (laughs) Is that something, Marcel, that um, the Lord might bring forth from this ugly time? You know, the, the, not to say that, uh, obviously, not to excuse anything, but just to know that, uh, you know, things can grow in manure and that God can take the wreckage of, of our mess and bring something good out of it when we, when we move past it. Is that something that we might be seeing? Are we seeing the end of, of clericalism in the church? (laughs) No, (laughs) <laughs> um, no, it'll never be gone completely again. Um, you know, the but I do think that and clericalism is only one part of a multi, you know, layered issue. I mm. think that clericalism is a big part of it. Mm. Um, men who have been removed from ordinary kind of life who, you know, uh, let's be honest, a lot of them have never been real leaders um, except in the priesthood. You know, when they're growing up, a lot of them are the quiet, shy kind of guy. Um, not necessarily the, the cool in front kind of leader, um, in their peer group before they went into seminary. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of these guys have brokenness that they've never dealt with that needs to heal. Um, some of them have never had an encounter with the Lord. So Mm -hmm. there's not even conversion in their own heart. Um, and then they're placed into a position where they're removed. They're kind of lonely and isolated, but also put up on a pedestal. Oh, father, this and oh, father, your homily was great. No, father, we can't, you know, it put in a position of leadership where father's will. If it, he says it, you know, especially generations ago, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's all those things are bad. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to overreact against that too. remember that the priesthood is a divinely ordained position that has true authority. Uh, especially in the spiritual world, but also over the church and should be in part of the governance of the church should always do that. Um, Do we need more lay uh, workers and people who are qualified to help and assist our clergy in running the church and doing the right thing and to evangelize and go out there? And of course, yes, yes. But we also have to remember that we can't just inject laity into the church and think it's going to fix things. No, the laity are the ones who are supposed to go and renew the temporal order. That's what Vatican II says. Mm -hmm. So let's not overswing this pendulum to the other side, where we're going to start a laicization now, where we're going to make the laity into a kind of clergy. That's the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. Um, What we need to do is have a proper understanding of our roles, our interplay, and how we're supposed to work in communion, this communio that JP2 talks about quite often. 
where we appreciate the gifts and charisms of the other and we cooperate and collaborate in a real way, not in just kind of a, a you know, this veneer of cooperation or collaboration. Now, with that being said, we have to also remember that we need men in these in, who are going to be holy saints, who are going to be you know, open and humble enough to say, you know what, I don't have all the gifts to be able to lead this great big organization. I mean, think of the mega parishes we're having to deal with today. I mean, I live in Texas. We have places where there's a man who's running 10,000 families mm -hmm. in some of these parishes, 10,000. And that's just the registered families, not even the others who are coming. And and, and a staff of maybe, you know, like I, I was running a staff of 60 something people at St. Mary's, but my pastor was my boss. He was in charge of all of us. Um, that's a tough thing to do, especially when you don't have a whole lot of leadership experience before the priesthood. So here's the thing. We need to be, you know, mindful of all this stuff, but we, we can't just plop the, the, the problems and the, and the scandals and other things in the church down on one issue, nor do we want to swing against something to where we're, we're overreacting. We want to have a, a sober discernment. How do we actually renew the church? And that's going to come over time. And it's, it's going to mean that, you know, there's a little bit of experimentation that needs to happen in, in the senses of how do we restructure things that can be restructured? Of course, we don't we don't change things that are divinely ordained. Um, and how, how do we work together and how do we how do we shift things here and how do we do it prayerfully? And, and experiment with this and then learn from our mistakes and from our successes as well. But really mindful of the fact that the mission of the church is not to be insular, not to just think inside and in issues of, uh, of all the structures and other things. But, but how do we have do all this stuff with a real eye towards our job is to go and make disciples, to change people's lives? And do we love the salvation of other people enough to do that? Mm, amen. A couple of thoughts. I mean, it's, it is such a blessing and a gift that uh, God has given us the structure. You know, we don't have to say, oh, gosh, so does that mean we, we remove the bishops and put lay people in charge? Like you say, oh. we, we, we can't. We, know, we already know the structure is sound. It comes to us from, from God himself. Um, and so, like you say, we have to figure out how, how do things work within that uh, structure. And, and one, one um, uh, example caught my eye today, Bishop uh, Philip uh, Egan out of uh, the Diocese of Portsmouth in England, uh, wrote an open letter to the Holy Father suggesting uh, that uh, there be a bit more of sort of a lay clerical collaboration come, uh, in, in dealing with uh, recent scandals in terms of even as an as a, uh, advance of the um, synod coming up with, with the bishops just to sort of begin to sort of get the ball rolling and get uh, collaborative work happening. Uh, and he also said we should talk specifically about the formation that uh, priests are able to get. And he just said, you know, in my own life, you know, I got this, we do develop this great program for seminarians, my adult model after Pastoro Pastoro. Pastor Dabo Vobis, um, and um, and but he said, you know, since I've been a priest, there's not really a lot of support. It's not a lot of. There's not really any performance evaluations, anything like that. I'm kind of just, you know, a tenure professor in a way. He didn't use those words, but so Marcel, in your experience, having uh, worked alongside uh, pastors in in a, a big sort of team environment, and I know you, uh, you know, from your work with Texas A&M uh, St. Mary's Catholic Center, you've also seen priests go on to be bishops. Maybe mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what how that kind of collaboration and friendship and working with pastors uh, can look? Because I don't think many uh, many of our, our lay people know what that could even look like. Yeah. Um, first thing I would say is like any relationship, uh, it has to be built on trust, which takes time, which takes friendship um, and uh, understanding each other and what you bring to the table and how the two, you know, you got to try to feel things out over time. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, you know, I will tell you this, I, I didn't let my pastor off the hook. Mm. Um, I did, and, and this goes for any of the pastors I've ever worked with and for. Um, I never let them off the hook. And the reason why is because if I think that, um, and I, I'm convicted that this is the way to move forward or we're doing the wrong thing or this is not the, you know, we're wasting our time or something, I'll go let them know. Mm -hmm. And I do so respectfully, but also boldly. Um, and I think that leaders need that. Pastors need that. Bishops need that. And especially bishops mm -hmm. who who all they ever are going to hear is, oh, Bishop, you're so wonderful, or, oh, Bishop, you're so terrible. There's never any real honest feedback of, okay, okay, can we have a discussion about what's going on and how things are going and what we need to do that's honest, you know, because it's kind of always, well, Bishop's Bishop, and he speaks, it's the gospel. No, it, we, we can't operate that way. In fact, sometimes when Bishop says something, you know, even if he puts his foot down, sometimes we need to push back a little bit, mm. um, you know, and, and that they need that. 
They need people who are going to help hold them accountable. And also, the other thing is, I think that a lot of times they live in isolation from one another, priests and bishops especially. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, every man that I've known that's ever been named a bishop who's been a friend of mine before he was a bishop, I've told him, congratulations and my condolences, because... <laughs> Um, it's a lonely, lonely place. And in fact, I went to my bishop at the Convocation of Bishops in in, um, Orlando last year. And I went to him and I, um, and I told him, I said, uh, Bishop, I want to, you know, this is, I I was starting Catholic Missionary Disciples. I told him about my plan and I, I rolled it all out. But I also told him, you know, I've been praying for you, Bishop, because I know it's a lonely position. And I've been praying that you have people around you who are real with you, who treat you like a man. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of thing I think that needs to happen is that you treat somebody like a human being first, because that's what they are men. They're always going to be men. That means they're sinners and they need they need to go to confession and they need somebody to help them and walk with them. And they just don't have that. And yes, we need to do better job training and helping bring them up. But we also need some men who are a little bit humble sometimes. You know, right now, um, the church is at an interesting moment in the life because we're shifting from kind of this, this status quo mentality to how do we really move forward to evangelization and discipleship? And we're kind of using, we're in the buzzword stage still in most places where we just buzzword it and then we, we don't change anything really. Yeah. But there are some places that are changing and that's what's fun. And I get to work with some of them. Marcel, so say, you know, speaking to average layperson, loves the church, you know, loves the Lord, uh, loves their priests and wants to help pull down some of the barriers that exist, you know, wants to be in that kind of relationship where, you know, both fraternal support and even fraternal correction could be possible. How do they even start that? How do you how do you make friends with your bishop? How do you make friends mm-hmm. with your pastor? Um, how do we sort of extend the hand to at least let them know that that's what we're offering? Yeah, I would say this. First of all, it doesn't start with complaining. Um, I, and I've made this mistake before when I was a young man. Um, I thought I was going to fix my parish. Um, I was just a regular old Joe parishioner. Um, I, it was, you know, I had moved away, graduated from college, got married. I started studying about the church. I thought I knew stuff about the liturgy. I went to a parish and and things were a little wacky in some of the liturgical stuff and the ways the, you know, the the preaching. And, and I thought I'd go fix this priest. Well, this guy was like, you know, 70 years old. Um, and I sat him down and I basically told him all the things he was doing wrong. Um, that's not the way to approach that. Now, what's funny is he kind of he kind of just kind of grinned at me and thought, OK, this kid's passionate. He cares and he's wrong. Um, now, I don't think I was wrong in some of the ways, but my approach was off. Um, you know, but my passion and my zeal and my love for the church and for Jesus Christ came out in that conversation. And he, he respected me enough to continue a conversation that lasted several years, where at the end of it, we still disagreed um, five years later when I left the parish. Um, but we had come to a recognition that the two of us shared a passion for, for Jesus and his church, and we appreciated one another, even if we disagreed, and we'd formed a relationship of some kind. Now, I'd gotten started on the wrong foot. You know, um, really, generally, if you want to start a relationship, you do it like anything else. You know, invite the priest or the bishop over for dinner if you're close enough for the bishop to be able to come. You know, my bishop lives an hour and a half away. It's kind of hard to have him over for dinner. Um, but I still know him, um, not well, but I know him well enough to be able to have conversation with him if I needed to, you know, to, to call him up and to do those things. Um, you know, it's it just takes time. So you have to put the effort and the time in like any relationship. If you want to do it, then you're going to probably have to instigate it in a lot of circumstances. Yeah. We just got a new priest. Um, he used to be one of my students. Um, he's a new associate pastor. Um, the first thing I did was I went to confession with him. I told him, I'm sorry for sullying your uh, priesthood with my confession. It was a joke. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing, right, that's going to help set us off on the right foot. you right. know. And we've already said we're going to set a time and have him over for dinner. We want to want to get to know you a little bit better. Um, we, we just want to get to know him as a man so that later on, if let's just say that he, you know, he, he has a comfort level where he can say something like, Hey, Marcel, what did you think about that homily? I can be honest with him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's where I, I like to get with our priests, our pastors, our bishops so that I can help them to grow as men of God so that I can be a real friend. Cause a real friend is going to be able to hold somebody accountable. A real friend is going to have an intimacy with somebody and a vulnerability, but that takes time and, and some effort. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and many of us may think, you know, Oh gosh, father's got so much on his plate. He doesn't, he doesn't have time <laughs> to come to mass for dinner, but I'll tell you a story. Um, our, growing up at our parish, um, the pastor, I remember he, he uh, put in the bulletin even, he said, Hey, I'm, I'm open for, for dinner. If you'd like to have me over, I'd love to come and get to know you. 
And uh, my parents uh, responded, and uh, he started coming over a lot. And my parents said, "Father, how, why do you give us so much of your time?" And he said, "Well, you're actually the only ones who responded to that uh, bulletin mm-hmm. thing, you know." And so uh, it's it's interesting, but why why not be you know super generous in the way in which we open our homes to our pastors and invite them out, you know? And maybe if one invitation doesn't work, try another one, you know. Father, could we, we're going out for for dinner at the pub. Would you like to join us, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, and just to to at least know that you've done everything that you can to try to befriend uh, your pastor. Or especially right now, isn't it? I mean, a, a, a bishop friend uh, retweeted something recently which said, you know, let's say a prayer for our priests because uh, right now it's probably pretty hard to put on the collar, you know, some days, you know, and, and what, what better opportunity to, to reach out and befriend a pastor when, you know, as, as we say, it's a difficult uh, time in the church for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, Marcel, just on, the, on, the, on that note, you know, what um, opportunities do you think that we as evangelizers should be looking to in this time? Probably part of us, you know, uh, out of a love for the church, wants to avoid conversations on this topic. Uh, but this is what is happening. This is what, you know, people in the church are talking about. And this is what people outside the church are talking about looking at the church. You know, what what do you think we should do in terms of maybe seeing this not not just for all of the ugly, but for the opportunity um, to have a conversation. Um, what would you say to a layperson who says, look, I, I know my family is going to, who don't go to church, they're going to have issues or whatever like that. What do I do uh, in this situation when our dirty laundry is all out there in the open? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the things I tell you is don't avoid these conversations. Uh, don't be afraid of them. Um, you know, you have to, you, in fact, I would encourage them. And, and the reason why I would encourage them is this. This is a unique opportunity to have a conversation about why you believe in God, why you are Catholic. How often do you get those from some of the folks who are going to, you know, want to talk about this? So, so encourage it, but but give a place where people can be outraged by the injustices because aren't you outraged by the injustices? So don't so don't be offended by somebody who says, "I don't know how you could be Catholic. Mm-hmm. I couldn't join an organization where all this stuff happened." Um and, and your immediate reaction should not be defensiveness. Your immediate reaction should be agreement, in mm-hmm. a sense. Mm-hmm. You know what? You're right. This is an injustice. You know what? You're right. This is wrong. And you know what? You're right. Sometimes it is hard to be Catholic. But here's the thing. I don't I don't just see the human side of the church. I see the divine side. Um, my relationship and my belief is not in the man-made structures and the men of the church. It's in God himself who set this up. And that's where my belief lies. And of course, we need to fight and, and do this stuff. Um, and our other reaction shouldn't be this. And this is what I've seen from a lot of people is, well, yeah, but the problems are bigger in, say, public schools or in this, you know, and and these people have their problems and these people have their, their problems. Look, um, we don't need to be. Uh, we, we've got a log in our eye right now. And let's remove it before we point out our brother's splinter. OK, Um so as, as the people of God right now, we have a unique opportunity to have these conversations. But what I would do is I'd start to ask a whole bunch of questions of somebody who asked me, you know, how could you be Catholic? And I'd say, well, do you know any organization in this world that, that's probably free of, a, of sin, you know, of, of sinners? No. OK, well, then I, could, I probably couldn't join any organization. Um, you couldn't either, right? No, I probably couldn't. You're right about that. But the church is supposed to be better. And you say, you know what? You're right. And that's why I'm trying to be holy. I'm trying to do the right thing, and I'm trying to trying to help the church to grow in that. Uh, because if I don't do it, then how can I say that I'm actually part of the solution instead of the problem? Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Marcel, thanks so much for uh, for uh, chatting today. It's always a great blessing. I love your passion. I love that you uh, don't tend to dodge uh, questions, tend to kind of go straight at them, which is wonderful. Um, CatholicMissionaryDisciples.com is where you can go to learn more about Marcel and his apostolate, CatholicMissionaryDisciples.com. You can also follow him on Twitter, at Marcel Lejeune. I do, and you should as well. Uh, great to chat with you, brother, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. God bless.